I'm Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Ya Jessie was only 26 years old when she debuted her critically acclaimed New York Times best-selling novel, Homegoing. It also won the coveted National Book Critics Award for Best First Book. Her latest book is Transcendent Kingdom, and it's very different from Homegoing. It's more of a personal story, a family story, it's the story of immigrants, depression, addiction, faith, science, and love. I read a review that put it more simply. It said, this book is brilliant. I'm delighted to welcome Ya Jesse to Between the Covers. Thank you for being here. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for having me. You are so talented that it took my breath away, honestly, reading this book. The main character is Gifty, and she's a neuroscientist studying reward-seeking behavior in mice. And the writing is so powerful, so personal, that I had to keep reminding myself, this is a novel, because I was really feeling Gifty's pain. If you don't mind, just for a, a second or so, Give us really the bird's eye view of what this book is about. Absolutely. Um, so this is a novel about a woman named Gifty uh, who is in the final years of her PhD program at Stanford and she studies neuroscience, uh, but more specifically than that, she studies something called the reward pathways of uh, the pathways of reward seeking behavior. Um, and basically, if you don't know what that means, uh, she studies addiction and depression. And it's at a time in her life when her own mother, who is suffering from depression, comes to stay with her. Um, so she's taking care of her mice, she's taking care of her mother, and she's reflecting on her childhood. There are some parallels with you and with Gifty. Gifty happens to be the youngest in an immigrant family from Ghana. And they live in Huntsville, Alabama, and so did you. Tell me about growing up in Huntsville. Yeah, uh, like Gifty, I grew up in Huntsville for the most part. Um, I was born in Ghana. My family moved around quite a bit. My father is a professor um, of French language and Francophone African literature, and we moved as he was kind of looking for a tenure track job. So we lived in Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, and then Alabama. Um, and Alabama, I think, formed the, the most important years of my life. Um, it's a place that I think about often, that I write about often, um, but no nowhere more deeply than in Transcendent Kingdom. Yeah, many immigrants feel that they're straddling two worlds. And in the book, you, you write about the children in the family and they're grappling with this, how they fit in, do they fit in, is this personal? Is it also something that you experienced? And in some way, did that experience encourage you to become a writer? Yes, it's deeply personal. Uh, like Gifty, I grew up between these two worlds. I was um, Ghanaian and living in America, uh, but my family also lived on the predominantly white side of town. And so there was this isolation factor at play as well. Um, and I found it really formative, that kind of loneliness, that isolation, that sense of kind of having to create a world for yourself um, to find a place wherein you fit. Um, and I think it absolutely informed my writing. And it's one of the reasons that I became a writer was to try to um, kind of create space for people who experience things that I experienced. Um, I'm a firm believer in that Morrison quote that uh, if you're looking for a book um, that and you want to read that and you can't find it, you must write it. So those th that's what I try to do with my with my writing. Thank you, Toni Morrison. Um, if people have Facebook questions, go ahead and send them right along and we will get to them a little later. I want to go back to the story. Gifty's family attends a white Pentecostal church in Huntsville. And apparently they are the only black family that attends this church. Religion is really a part of this story. Did your religious upbringing factor into Gifty's story? And I, I, I'll let you answer, but there's a quote in the book that says, 
not all churches in America are created equal. Yes, um, it did. It did impact the writing of this book. Like Gifty, I grew up Pentecostal um, and I was raised in the church. My family was incredibly devout. Uh, we went to church uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday nights. Uh, we went to Bible study. Um, it was a hugely important part of my life and one that I think I still grapple with all of these years later. Um, it informed my thinking. Um, it informed my ideas about community, um, but at the same time, like Gifty, I did go to a predominantly white church um, and experience the kinds of racism that Gifty experiences in the novel. And so that colored my relationship to the church. And, and that aspect of the book is quite personal to me, though I think Gifty has it a lot harder than I had it. Um, it, still, it still comes up. It feels personal from, from the, the reader's perspective. Here's what I love. The adult Gifty, the scientist, is such an interesting contradiction, especially when it comes to weighing religion and science. And I, you feel the, the tension. And tell me about the struggle for her. Mm. Yes, Gifty grew up in the church, as, as I mentioned before. Um, she's raised by an incredibly devout mother, and she herself is, is incredibly pious, um, in great part, I think, because she's a child who's very invested in trying to be good. You know, she wants to be morally right. Um, she wants to do the right thing, and church provides her an opportunity to um, strive toward that. Um, and church also, I think, provides her a place where she can ask big questions about why we're here, what it means to be alive, um, those kinds of burning questions that she had as a child. As she grows up um, and starts to pull away from the church because of certain experiences, um, she, she moves toward science, um, which feels empirical, which feels, um, you know, objective um, in its search for goodness. But what she finds is that she still has all of those same questions. Why are we here? What does it mean to be alive? How do we make sense out of a life in which senseless things happen? Um, but she shifts from, from that religious lens towards the scientific one um, in, her, in her drive, her quest to answer those questions. With her work, Gifty says, and this is a quote from the book, I would always have something to prove and nothing but blazing brilliance would be enough to prove it. I think we need to delve into that one. What, what did you mean? I think that Gifty there is kind of echoing this idea of uh, kind of black respectability politics, as we call it, this idea that you have to be twice as good to get half as far, um, that the only way to kind of be recognized, um, accepted as equal is by this having this kind of overachieving attitude. Um, and Gifty really internalizes that message and, and runs with it. She's an incredibly, um, incredibly successful woman who has accomplished a great deal in her short lifetime. And yet, as she finds, that success does not insulate her from the pain of this world. It doesn't protect her brother. Um, it doesn't protect her mother and father in some ways. Um, so she still ends up grappling with the racism that she was trying to escape through, um, through those achievements. Is that also something personal? I can't imagine someone as successful as you who has achieved what you have achieved having those fears. Mm. You know, it, it is, but it isn't. You know, I think I grew up with similar a similar kind of ideology, certainly had parents who um, had the, I think, immigrant brand of that. You know, you had to do as well as you could um, in order to kind of gain a foothold in this country that can be quite difficult for, uh, for immigrants and for Black people, obviously. Um, so I grew up understanding that. Um, but I think I was quicker to realize um, quicker than gifty to realize that that some of this messaging was doing me a disservice and doing other people um, like me a disservice. And, and so I think um, while I'm happy uh, for the success that I've had, um, incredibly grateful for the people who, who are buying the books, reading the books and engaging with them, um, I'm, I'm lucky in that I know that, that my worth comes from, from much more than, than these books that I write. A sense of place is important for 
really for any novel to, to resonate. And I feel this honestly in three areas in Transcendent Kingdom. Huntsville, Alabama, obviously, is one. And the other two would be the church and Gifty's lab. Would you talk a little bit about a sense of place from the writer's perspective? Yes, place is hugely important to me. I, I write about place a lot. I think about place a lot. I think this has um, much to do with the fact that, as I mentioned before, I moved around a lot when I was younger. Um, and all of the different places that I lived in had you know, different ways of thinking. Uh, the, the communities were different. What they valued were different. Their politics were different. Um, I think it afforded me the opportunity to see the fact that so much of who we think we are, so much of how we construct ourselves has to do with, with the place that we live in and the people around us and what they think and how they feel. Um, and so I'm always kind of striving to capture the essence of a place in my writing, um, to capture that kind of community-minded response to, to being alive. Um, the lab, as you said, is really important, but more so than just that physical place, the people in the lab and what they think and how they viewed Gifty. Um, so that's that's what I'm always trying to kind of um, uh, toggle between. I really want to look at depression and how mental illness is looming in this family. And there's a scene in the book, at the very beginning of the book, where Gifty is 11 years old. She's sent to be living with her aunt in Ghana for a while, and they're at a market. Her aunt points out, quote, a crazy man. And to the child, to this 11-year-old girl, this man is far less crazy than her own mother, who is bedridden in America with depression. And if you could indulge me and everyone else who's watching, at the starting at the end of page one, if you could read that to get a sense of what we're talking about. I'd be happy to. Even now, I don't completely understand why my aunt singled the man out to me. Maybe she thought there were no crazy people in America, that I had never seen one before. Or maybe she was thinking about my mother, about the real reason I was stuck in Ghana that summer, sweating in a stall with an aunt I hardly knew while my mother healed at home in Alabama. I was 11 and I could see that my mother wasn't sick, not in the ways that I was used to. I didn't understand what my mother needed healing from. I didn't understand, but I did. And my embarrassment at my aunt's loud gesture had as much to do with my understanding as it did with the man who had passed us by. My aunt was saying, that, that is what crazy looks like. But instead, what I heard was my mother's name. What I saw was my mother's face, still as lake water, the pastor's hand resting gently on her forehead, his prayer a light hum that made the room buzz. I'm not sure I know what crazy looks like, but even today, when I hear the word, I picture a split screen, the dreadlocked man in Kejitia on one side, my mother lying in bed on the other. I think about how no one at all reacted to that man in the market, not in fear or disgust, nothing, save my aunt who wanted me to look. He was, it seemed to me, at perfect peace, even as he gesticulated wildly, even as he mumbled. But my mother, in her bed, infinitely still, was wild inside. Hearing it from your voice is, is like icing on the cake. Thank you for that. That's, it's, it's beautiful. You cite a study in the book that actually points to cultural differences I, I believe it was in schizophrenia in Ghana, India, and in the United States. That was a real study? 
Yes, it's a real study. Uh, it came out in 2015 by a researcher named Lerman. Um, and she and her colleagues looked at uh, schizophrenics in India, Ghana, and the United States. And what they found was that in India and Ghana, um, the schizophrenics had far better relationships to the voices that they were hearing. They were the voice of friends and family members. They were the voice of God. Um, the, the people felt as though they understood and recognized those voices. Um, in America, the voices uh, were described as being violent, intrusive, harsh, um, a bombardment. Fascinating. We do have a, a Facebook question that has come in and, and I was curious about this too. Where did the name Gifty come from? Is that a common name in Ghana? Um, it's relatively common, yes. I think of it as um, as a fruit of the spirit name. Ghanaians like these kinds of names. There's uh, peace and comfort and joy um, and Gifty. Um, it's actually my cousin's name, which a name that I've always loved. So I knew that I wanted to include it eventually in some work. Um, and this work felt particularly resonant because there's so much discussion about um, Gifty's brother, Nana, being the real gift, the true gift. And so Gifty has this name that acts as a kind of irony. You know, is she, is she a gift to her family? In the book, Gifty's teenage brother dies of an overdose, and he was a high school sports star. He has an injury. He's prescribed OxyContin. What happens really is the destruction of a family after this. And there have been so many books, news reports about opioid addiction in, in recent years, yet there is a double standard so it seems between the white affluent teen addict and the black teen addict and you really wanted that to be pointed out did you not i did you know like so many of us i was reading about the opioid epidemic and its effects not just on the person suffering from opioid use disorder but also on uh, the rippling out effect on the family and the community um, there were great documentaries about uh, first responder firefighters who were learning how to deal with um, overdose issues. Um, I, I found all of that reporting really fascinating and sensitive and nuanced um, and humanizing. Um, but I also recognized that it was happening in large part because this crisis is affecting um, white suburban and rural inhabitants in greater numbers um, than black people. And I felt like um, this push toward uh, toward thinking about addiction as a healthcare issue and not as a criminal issue was coming at the expense of all of the Black people um, who are caught up in in the uh, criminal justice system because of uh, what is clearly an illness. We have another question, and I was thinking this too. Were you already interested in science when you? started researching this book? Did you get more interested as, as you were doing it? And what's really amazing to me is that I'm reading this book. I have zero science background, yet you made it so fascinating when she's in her lab and we're doing these studies. So is your background at all in science? <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad, you know, I really wanted a lay person to be able to pick up this book and feel as though they could understand the, the complex science that was taking place. Um, I do not have a background in science. I had not taken a science class. Uh, since college when I started writing this book. Um, but what I do have is a very generous and lovely best friend who is herself a neuroscientist. Um, and around the time my first novel came out, she had a major paper that was due to be published um, that I was fortunate enough to try to read, couldn't understand, um, and realized that I wanted to learn more about what she did all day. Um, so I didn't know I was writing a book at that time. I just kind of wanted to have a basic understanding of my friend's research. Um, and as that understanding grew, I became more and more fascinated with it. Um, and as I do with anything that I'm curious about, I decided it was time to make fiction. Loss is a thread throughout the book. The book, it has flashbacks 
uh, to when Gifty was in a family of four and then a family of three and then a family of two. And her father, I'm not really giving it a lot away, but her father was not much of a presence in her life. And I'll say as a reader, I, I just didn't like his choices. But then there was this one sentence that softened it for me. And the sentence was, America changes around big black men. Now you wanted us to know what it was like for this man to be living in Alabama. Tell me about her father and why his role was so important in this story. Yeah, I do think that this book is very much about these absences that form a kind of presence in Gifty's life. Um, and one of the major absences is, as you mentioned, her father. Um, he didn't really want to move to America. It was his wife's decision. Um, so he got kind of talked into it. Um, and then when he arrives in America, they end up in Alabama of all places. Um, and it was it was a culture shock completely for him, you know, coming from a country where everyone is the same race as you, um, it's it's shocking, A, just to arrive in a country where you experience racism on any level, um, but to be in a state like Alabama where he was experiencing it so explicitly, um, I think really started to, to wear him down. Um, and ultimately he decided that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't abide uh, what he was going through anymore. And he makes the decision to return to Ghana. Um, I think it fills the family with this void that they spend the rest of the novel trying to, trying to fill. Um, Nana fills it in, in one way, Gifty fills it in another, um, and her mother, you know, fills it in, in even, even a, yet another way. Gifty says at some point um, that she thinks of her mother as callous. Um, and if she thinks of her mother as callous, she has to remember that a callus is the hardened tissue that forms over a wound. Um, and this wound, I think, was her husband leaving. As, as much as the father had an impact, it truly is a mother-daughter story that takes it to a, another level. And I don't want it to spoil things, but that, that there must've been some passages that were difficult to write. Mm. Yes, um, Gifty and her mother have a an incredibly thorny relationship. Um, that's kind of putting it mildly. They're two women who don't really see eye to eye, who don't really know how to communicate with each other, and who have kind of lost the language with which they used to communicate with each other um, because Gifty is no longer in the church, which is uh, her mother's entire world. Um, so as her mother becomes more and more depressed, Gifty finds herself really struggling to draw her out and connect with her. Um, and yet I think one of the, the loveliest things about this novel um, is the way that these two women figure out ways to care for one another, to take care of each other. Um, and that's where the love, I think, starts to, to peek through. Your first novel, Homegoing, was, and I want to say an enormous story because it, it, it just, the, the span of it was huge. This one is, I, I can say, smaller. It, it's a family story. Are you glad that the progression was from that story to this one? Did it make it more accessible for you to write this one? It didn't really feel like a conscious choice. You know, when I started writing Homegoing, I just felt so, um, so overcome, so inhabited by the characters, by the story um, that, that I knew that it was what I wanted to write. Um, and it was, as you said, like an incredibly large, sprawling story. It took me years to write. Um, and after I finished it, I, I did have this moment of feeling kind of bereft, like, what do I do now? Um, I've spent all this time with these characters. Where do I go from here? And there was something really nice about um, pivoting to a smaller canvas, to a single voice in the first person where I got to know this one character as intimately as one can know a character. Um, there, there was a you know, great challenge to that, um, but, but it felt like the natural progression to make and, and it was really freeing as well. 
I would love to end on what you were doing at seven years old. And I believe there's a reading rainbow connection. Did you really, <laughs> did, did you submit a story to reading rainbow? I did. Yes. I was a, an incredibly, a huge reading rainbow fan, um, a lot of our Burton fan. Um, and I noticed that they sent out a call for young writers and illustrators to send in work for their competition. Um, I convinced my dad to let me enter. He pulled out the typewriter. I wrote a story about a little girl who wants a dog um, and entered that story. I didn't win, but I did get honorable mention. Um, and it was it's one of the highlights of my career thus far. <laughs> The book is Transcendent Kingdom. It's a story of race in America, a novel of faith, science, and love. Ya yeah, Jesse, thank you so much for writing it. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Anne. My pleasure. I'm Anne Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next Between the Covers. Mm -hmm.